Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you all here again. Uh, you may uh, remember those of you who are here last week uh, that I pointed out that the great bulk of Christian art from the early centuries that has survived is to be found under the streets of present-day Rome. Uh, and in the, uh, those frescoes, the dominant image of Jesus is a wonder worker. Uh, and here you can see him uh, turning, uh, d performing some uh, miracle, uh, perhaps the miracle of the loaves. And we have to bear in mind that magic was a major part of the world really until the 17th century and certainly played a very, very major role uh, at the stage in life history when the Christian church first grew up. Uh, and the Christian church wanted to assert uh, that the power of God, the miracles of God, were far more significant and powerful uh, than any magic by magicians. Uh, but they didn't scruple uh, to use some of the magician signs for Jesus. So if you lift over there, you can see the magician's wand. And this is another one. It's obviously Jesus raising the dead, which of course was very important in the catacombs, which was the place where the Christians were buried. And uh, we have, again, the magician's uh, wand. Christ, the wonder worker, one of the major images of Jesus at that time. Uh, you might also note that he looks, I think, there uh, at Jesus without a beard. Jesus is also depicted in the catacombs as a teacher. There you see him surrounded uh, by his uh, friends. And in the fourth century, when Christians began to come above ground and carve sarcophagi for their uh, dead, uh, again, the scenes of the life of Jesus were depicted. I know this is a little bit blurred, uh, but this is from uh, an image that I'll be showing early next year in rather more detail. It's actually Jesus being brought before Pilate. Uh, and you notice there uh, that uh, Jesus is depicted as a beardless Roman youth uh, with long curly hair. And again here, he's a beard, Roman beardless uh, youth. And this is uh, one of the first evolution of images. It's called uh, the traditio uh, legis, uh, the handing over of the law uh, to Peter with Paul looking on. Uh, the scroll here is the New Testament or the New Covenant uh, which is handed over to Peter. And of course, uh, by the uh, second and third centuries, uh, uh, quarters of the fourth century, the Bishop of Rome had become uh, one of uh, uh, the most, or perhaps the most significant figure uh, in, in Rome. Uh, and hence we get this kind of, of image of, of Jesus in his divine authority as it were, giving authority uh, to Peter and Paul. This is a very rare image from this country, Hinton St. Mary. Again, you can see that uh, Jesus is without a beard. Fourth century image, which you'll find in the British Museum. Now this is another image, early image, um, and here again is Jesus with his disciples, but you'll see here that he's got a beard. And this is another image from the catacombs, a fourth century uh, image, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus very bearded there and clearly reflecting 
some of the features of Jupiter, the chief of the Roman gods. Christian Church has taken over something of that iconography. As I mentioned last time, the tradition of biblical illustration uh, grew up. This is uh, a, a scene from the Rosano Gospels. Uh, again, here is Jesus is bearded. Um, but this garb here, uh, and riding sad saddle on a donkey, uh, many scholars believe this, this is uh, depicting him uh, as much as a philosopher as anything else. But as the 4th century went on and gave way to the 5th century, uh, oh, this has seemed to have got slightly out of sync, um, but the, this is uh, the, the image of Jesus, which eventually became the uh, definitive one. Uh, this is from a 6th century icon to be discovered at uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And it is just the sort of image that Orthodox iconographers today uh, would uh, use. Full face, face, bearded, hand up in blessing with the gospel uh, in his left hand. As the 4th and 5th century uh, went on, um, we get clearly greater emphasis upon the kingly and divine rule uh, of Christ. Here uh, is Christ uh, sitting on his throne with, against a backdrop uh, of, of Rome. This is in uh, St. Uh, Prudenziana in Rome, dating from the year uh, 400. And if you look close up there, uh, that one, this one, some of this has been rather restored from the 19th century, but you can, it, it, the, the, this figure, the figure of, of Christ, I think, is mainly unrestored. But you can see a very bearded figure. For a long time, Christian scholars uh, believe that the imagery was basically kingly image, images. But uh, uh, more recently, at least some scholars have, sort of, emphasized that it's less the features of the king that's been taken over, more the figures of divinity, in particular uh, the features of uh, Jupiter, the king of the gods. But although in that last image Christ was depicted as a ruler who was bearded, uh, he can also be depicted like this from the same period. You see, unbearded. Uh, and this uh, is from St. Vitali in Ravenna, a wonderful uh, mosaic, 6th century mosaic. Uh, Jesus, the ruler of the cosmos, sitting on the cosmos, uh, but still looking uh, young. And what's even more amazing uh, is that both these images, the bearded and the unbearded Jesus, can appear in the same church. This is from St. Constanza, the mausoleum built by Constantine the Great for his daughter in the 4th century. Uh, and this is clearly uh, a, uh, a beardless Jesus. It's another tragedio legis sign. You can see he's handing over the scroll there uh, to Peter with Paul looking on. Uh, but in the same church, there is this image where he's looking like a, uh, a, a Jupiter figure again. <coughs> and no less remarkable, and again in Ravenna, uh, in the church of St. Apollinaria nu Nuovo, uh, from the 6th century, there are 26 scenes in the upper register, half showing Je Jesus beardless and half uh, bearded. It's the ones on the passion scene which are bearded, um, now, some people used to suggest that uh, this reflects the time uh, when the church was uh, Arian and then later taken over by the Orthodox. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be a very convincing uh, description because you have two baptistries 
in Ravenna, one the old Arian baptistry and one the orthodox baptistry. In the Arian baptistry, Jesus is unbearded. But then when that baptistry was taken over by the orthodox Catholics, they didn't bother to change the imagery. In other words, it was quite acceptable to them to have either a bearded or an unbearded Jesus. But this is in, uh, in St. Apollinaro. Uh, that is uh, the registers in the, uh, which show him Jesus uh, unbearded, but uh, there is also the same church, same upper register, which show him uh, bearded. Uh, they didn't seem to find any contradiction in, uh, in this. Uh, the differences uh, can't be accounted for simply in terms of, uh, of choice uh, uh, or taste of the patron or artist. Um, it, obviously, uh, Christian iconography was much too important in those days uh, to be simply to be left to the individual's taste. Yet no convincing dogmatic reason has been found for uh, the, uh, the difference. Um, uh, obviously what seems to have happened is that they have taken over some of the aspects of Jupiter, the king of gods, to emphasize one aspect of the divinity of Christ and certain aspects of Dionysus, the sort of youthful, uh, life-giving uh, Roman god, to take over other aspects uh, of what they wanted to convey uh, through the divinity of Christ. Uh, other points which might just be worth bearing in mind the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Emperor, was beardless, without a beard, and he set a fashion for uh, emperors without beards for the, most of that century, so that may have been one uh, trend they wanted to follow. Jews in, were bearded, Ju Jewish males were bearded, uh, and there was a very large Jewish community in Rome at that time. Uh, but it may be that the Christian church, when it split from the synagogue, deliberately wanted to emphasize the difference from, of, of, of Jesus from the average Jew and therefore depicted him at least sometimes as that beardless young uh, Roman. Uh, and then of course in the 6th century when the monastic movement grew up and monks tended to grow beards it may be that again the idea of Jesus being bearded uh, took hold uh, and as we know that did eventually become uh, the definitive uh, image. Well that's so much for uh, the as it were, the history of, of the image uh, until uh, the 6th century. What about the tradition? According to Eusebius, uh, the 4th century church historian, King Agbar of Edessa, which is Urfa in southwest Turkey, received a letter from Jesus. And by the 6th century, it was also believed that he'd received a towel with the image of Jesus miraculously printed on it to cure his illness. And this alleged image became very influential. And here we have a 10th century icon, which is in St. Catherine's Monastery, of King Adbar, Agbar, uh, with the image of Jesus there uh, on that uh, towel, or that uh, mandillion. There you can see uh, the image uh, of Jesus, which... King Adbar uh, is holding up. And there is a later uh, image of uh, exactly the same kind. Uh, and until 1914, this was the image uh, that Orthodox soldiers carried into battle. Uh, this face of, of Jesus on the towel, the Mandilion, which it was believed uh, was a direct impress on a towel which had been sent to King Adbar. Now, in the West, their equivalent uh, to that was the uh, Veronica with image. Um, you perhaps know from the uh, legend uh, that as Jesus was on the way to the cross, uh, Veronica wiped his face with a piece of cloth uh, called a sudarium, uh, and uh, the tradition that this imprinted the face of Jesus on it uh, dates from the 4th century, uh, and the first copies we have uh, are from the 14th century. Now this, uh, as well as the Orthodox one, uh, are called uh, achiropoeic, uh, that is, images not made with hands. And the best one today of these images not made with hands, there are three basically ones, the Orthodox one, the Veronica one, and this one, uh, which is the Turin Shroud. 
and the carbon dating for that is 1260 to 1390. Now it's very important to remember that Jesus has been depicted in a whole range of styles over the centuries. Here is the book of Kells where uh, Jesus is looking uh, very much like an Irishman <laughs> dating from the 8th century. Some of my favourite and most remarkable ones are the Catalan Majesties. There's a wonderful museum of Catalan art in Barcelona if you ever go there. They've collected a lot of the best artwork from medieval Catalan churches and this is a 12th uh, century image uh, of Jesus, uh, Jesus in, in majesty and there is a close-up of it. And of course we have some wonderful 12th century carvings particularly from uh, Germany many very very fine medieval wood carvings now when we get to this period the 11th and 12th century uh, we're of course in the great period of cathedral building uh, first Romanesque and then Gothic and as the pilgrims uh, approach these uh, cathedrals uh, on the uh, pilgrimage uh, to uh, Compostela uh, as they approached the great west door they would have lucked up and on the tympanum the great carved uh, slab of uh, stone over the west door uh, they would have seen a sign like this places like Oturn, Vesely, Moissac, Conch and Chart uh, and here is the tympanum at Conch dating from uh, the first quarter of the 12th century which was on the pilgrimage route. It shows Christ as judge <coughs> uh, and uh, there are vivid pictures there and elsewhere uh, of uh, people being thrown into hell or received into heaven and all sorts of powerful warnings against things like greed. This is the tympanum at Chartres, uh, which is actually uh, slightly different from the others. Uh, it's not uh, Christ in judgment, but it is Christ in uh, majesty uh, sending out uh, the church in a Pentecostal mission, which of course was associated at the time also in people's minds uh, with the Crusades. Christ as the great divine teacher saying to his disciples, go out and convert uh, the world. Uh, the unbelievers on this tympanum are shown as physically uh, ugly. This, this dates from about 11th... Uh, uh, sorry, this is the, sorry, this is the one at, at Chart. Uh, and, yeah, that's the Chart as well. And that's the Vesele. Let's just go back to those Chart ones. There is the Chart one, which is Christ in Majesty, transitional Romanesque Gothic, and the signs of the four evangelists. Uh, round uh, the figure of Christ in a mandorla. There's a, a close-up, a better a view of it. Very, very uh, wonderful work of art. Now this is one from Vesele, uh, which is the Pentecostal mission dating from 1130, where Christ is sending his apostles out to convert uh, the world. The one medieval carver from this period whose name we know, uh, Gisalbertus, worked here at Vesele and also at Oton. Now during the medieval period, uh, there was also a very great emphasis upon the suffering of uh, Christ. Um, innumerable pictures of the Passion and I'm not showing any here because later next year I've got a whole uh, lecture on the Passion in Art but I'll just be showing uh, uh, three rather different kind of images which emphasize the same scene. Uh, this is a scene known as the Man of Sorrows uh, 
And in this sort of late medieval period, sort of the 15th century, uh, art ceased to be only for public consumption and came indoors into people's houses for an intimate personal devotion. Uh, and as personal devotion at that time, as a result of the Franciscans and the Dominicans, had become very, very intense indeed, people could meditate before an image in their own homes with a tremendous uh, sense of, of, of realism uh, and uh, emotion. So this is the Man of Sorrows, a small image to encourage intimacy for use in private prayer, with, sort of, with associated with words of reproach and disappointment and designed to induce feelings of compassion and repentance through the eyes, the tears, the lips and the shoulders. Now this is actually quite a late one from the workshop of Jan Mostert to the 1520s in the Netherlands. And it's also been influenced by a, a lay movement of spirituality called the Devotio Moderna, which encouraged intense emotional engagement amongst lay people. Now this is an even more unusual image, Christ with the cold stone. Uh, one of these appeared actually in uh, the wonderful exhibition at the National Gallery a few years ago um, called uh, Seeing Salvation. Uh, this was an image of late uh, Northern European uh, uh, medieval piety, about 1500, when they broke the, up the passion in different parts to meditate on it. This scene is not in the Bible, uh, but it sort of sums up the abyss of, of, of suffering which they saw Christ going through. And many texts would have come into the uh, devotee's mind, especially Lamentations 1.12, O all ye that pass by, attend and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. So that's Christ of the cold stone sitting uh, there on the way to the cross. And here is another very unusual image, uh, the soul contemplating the suffering of Christ. Very rare religious painting by Velasquez, rather later, 1620s. Of course, the flagellation of Jesus is mentioned in the Gospels, uh, but not, it wasn't depicted in this kind of meditative way. And the, uh, earlier, the picture bore the title, O soul, have pity on me, for you have reduced me to this state. It was exhibited in London in 1884, and nobody could quite understand what it was about, and they couldn't quite find a title for it. So during this medieval period, as well as the great emphasis upon uh, judgment and purgatory, which the pilgrim would have been highly aware of as they approached the church and looked up above the great west door, there was an equal emphasis upon Christ entering into the sin and sufferings of the world on behalf of uh, humanity. But if we go back a little bit uh, earlier into Italy, uh, we of course have the early Renaissance. 13th and 14th century, uh, where there was an emphasis upon uh, the humanity of Christ, upon his gentleness, uh, it drew upon uh, classical lines, and we have the beginnings of perspective. But I love the early Renaissance, as I suspect some of you do here, because it still has a lingering Byzantine feel to it, and this imparts a sense of, of spirituality. Uh, this, of course, is by Duccio from the uh, end of the 13th, beginning of the 14th century. Uh, in Siena, uh, there is his great maes, 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 maester um, of the Virgin Mary. On the back of that, uh, there are literally scores of little gospel scenes, of which this is one, the temptation of Jesus, very rare scene, uh, now actually that one in New York. Uh, but still in Siena, this is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. A great sense of, of, of humanity and feeling there. And, and perhaps an even more moving one of Duccio, another one of those panels. And that's Jesus before Pilate. Looking very vulnerable, though also looking at Pilate with those eyes. And of course, after Duccio, we have 
the wonderful Giotto from, uh, again, the end of the 13th century and the first half of the 14th century. Uh, this is one of his frescoes from his masterpiece in the Scrivani Chapel in Padua uh, with its new emphasis upon naturalism and drama. This, of course, is the uh, betrayal by a kiss by Judas. And this is a no less wonderful image, though afraid I couldn't find a better reproduction of it than this. It doesn't really give its full force. But this is the lamentation, where there's tremendous sense of, of feeling there. Now, as we might expect, when we come to the High Renaissance, the way Jesus is depicted reflects the interests and the style of the High Renaissance with an emphasis upon powerful perspective, uh, the beauty of the body and a great emphasis upon emotion and drama. Here we have Mantegna uh, from the 15th century, the dead body of Jesus from a very, very unusual perspective looking from the feet as it were towards uh, the head uh, with the women weeping down, looking up one side. Uh, but clearly, uh, Mantegna is really enjoying using all his skills of perspective uh, and uh, his sense of the human body uh, in order to create uh, uh, that uh, scene. He, with, uh, uh, artists with even more emphasis upon uh, the body, and in particular in his uh, case, uh, the beauty of the human body, uh, Michelangelo from the uh, end of the 15th and first half of the 16th century, his famous Pieta. And his Nicodemus holding the dead body of Jesus. According to tradition, Nicodemus was meant to be a sculptor uh, and here Michelangelo has depicted himself as Nicodemus uh, holding the dead body of Jesus. And again, uh, a wonderful sense there uh, of, the, of the glory and the beauty of the body of Jesus. And of course when we come to Titian, there's a similar emphasis uh, upon uh, the sheer uh, drama is Jesus and Peter. <coughs> now when we come to the 17th century, again in quite a lot of artists uh, with, this, with the sort of height of the Counter-Reformation, uh, there was an even greater emphasis upon drama and the effects of light and dark as we get with Caravaggio from the uh, last half of the 16th and first half of the 17th century, Christ at the Column. Not a very good reproduction that, I'm afraid. Uh, and perhaps a no less or even more so uh, El Greco, again from uh, the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. Uh, you probably know that uh, El Greco started as an icon painter, a Greek icon painter in Crete. His proper name is Domenikos Theotokopoulos, uh, but was called uh, simply the Greek, El Greco. Uh, and this is one of his versions of the cleansing of the temple with all the emphasis upon uh, the sheer drama and movement of the uh, Counter-Reformation which used drama a lot in order to convey Christian truth. But in contrast to that, uh, you get a rather different emphasis uh, in uh, Northern Europe. Rembrandt, as you probably know, if you've probably seen lots of his paintings, he began uh, with, a, with an extraordinary grandiose Baroque style, loved to paint these great big scenes from the Old Testament uh, with a huge sense of, of drama. 
After a series of personal crises, deaths uh, and, uh, and debt, uh, his style became, as it were, much more subdued but also in some ways much more intense and personal. This was called the 100 Gilder print and it's called this because Rembrandt apparently had to pay 100 Gilders in order to buy a copy back. It's based on Matthew chapter 19 but all the incidents described in chapter 19 are crammed into one scene with people wanting to be healed, women their children blessed, the religious leaders arguing in the background, the rich young man who failed to follow Christ. And this uh, has been one of the most popular religious paintings ever. Uh, in its day and for centuries it was uh, truly iconic, uh, particularly for Protestant households. It seems somehow uh, to bring to Jesus all in uh, th there you see people bringing their wanting to be healed here if I can see it properly uh, women wanting to bring their children to be blessed a background are religious leaders arguing somewhere is a Latin, I can't really see it in my glasses there's a rich young man looking rather rather lost having failed to uh, uh, follow Christ but all the incidents from, from Matthew 19 uh, convey, conveyed in one, one scene with Christ at the, at the centre. The 18th century was not a great time for religious painting. Wonderful time, of course, for portraits and landscapes. Uh, but uh, towards the end of the 18th century and in the beginning of the 19th century, we have the unique William Blake of, of Will, uh, the vi unique vision of William Blake. Uh, here is his version of the Ascension. That's a fairly traditional image, but a lot of uh, re uh, Blake's religious imagery uh, is literally unique to himself. In the 19th century, after the Evangelical Revival and the Oxford Movement or Catholic Revival. Uh, there was also a revival of art on religious themes. Uh, this is by Holman Hunt, lived from 1827 to 1910. Uh, he was uh, one of the original members of the Pre-Raphaelite uh, Brotherhood. Uh, later in life he went to the Middle East with a view to painting biblical scenes with greater realism. And indeed when he came back and started to paint scenes like this, Christ in the Carpenter's Shop, there was public outcry, outcry uh, at his realism. I mean, to us, when we look at that, that looks, in some ways, rather a typical Victorian religious painting. But it caused an outcry at the time because it seemed uh, to them to, uh, to be, as it were, too realistic, too down to earth. I mean, there are even wood, wood chips, aren't there? Wood carvings on the, on, the, on the carpenter's floor there. So that's Christ uh, in the carpenter's shop as a child. And here's another of Holman Hans. This is Christ in the carpenter's shop with the shadow. And there's, there's the shadow. And this is perhaps the most famous of all the Victorian religious paintings like Rembrandt's 100 Gilder print, it achieved iconic status by Hellman Hunt. There's one version in Keble College, Oxford, and the other in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. It's Christ knocking on the door, uh, which is the, an image we get from the book of, of Revelation, uh, but it's actually called Christ the Light of the World, and the light there is there, obviously, with the candle, but he's knocking on the door, which has got rather encrusted by... Uh, weeds and of sinfulness there. Now when we come to the uh, 20th uh, century, modernism is said to have begun in 1910 in Paris uh, with uh, the novels of jo James Joyce, the music of Stravinsky, the poetry of Pound and, and Eliot. Uh, but I think that probably modernism in painting began a little bit before that. But certainly around that time, around in 1905, there began a, music, a, a, 
a, a movement called uh, Die Brücke, the bridge, uh, and uh, Nolde, N-O-L-D-E, uh, was for a short time a member of uh, this uh, group, uh, a, part, a group which we, we tend now to refer to as, as German Expressionism. Nolde lived a long life, 1867 to 1956. He was brought up on a Danish farm which had been in his mother's family for nine generations. His parents were deeply religious Frisian peasants and religious themes occur in his paintings with a visionary sense that all nature was alive and demanded that he paint it. And you can here see here uh, Christ with the children, not a very usual scene in Christian art, but uh, we get it in, in Euro Northern Europe from about uh, the uh, 16th, 17th century, if my memory is uh, correct, occasionally at least. Um, and here uh, is his version of Pentecost. And you can see that through the sort of vivid use of, of colour uh, and the expressions, there's a certain sense of, of kind of not just force but almost violence uh, there. More significant than Nolde is a religious uh, painter in the 20th century was Rouault. Uh, Rouault, 1871 to 1958, as you might guess from his paintings, began as a stained glass maker. He had a severe nervous breakdown. He was a very devout Catholic. And he believed that under our spangled banners as human beings, we are in fact all clowns and he very often painted clowns. Um, he had a s profound sense of pity for the suffering of every human soul and uh, a sense of the suffering of Christ. Uh, and this is his face of Jesus in another of his paintings. Um, on, on one of his uh, paintings, uh, he, he gives to uh, the head of Christ some words from Pascal, Christ suffers uh, until the end of time. But you can see this image also takes up the idea of, uh, of Veronica's image, or if you like, the King Agbar's image, of a, a, an image imprinted on a cloth or a towel. Chagall is about the same sort of time, very interesting figure, 1887 to 1985. He was Jewish from uh, Russia, but there was quite a movement in Russia at the time of, of, of Jewish uh, artists who were very interested in, in Jesus as a figure to paint. Um, and Chagall painted a number of paintings uh, with a figure of Jesus in it. And he, this is an extraordinary painting in a way because it's the story, it's the painting of the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, but God's, instead of being depicted as it were in a Hebrew way, is depicted very much uh, in a, a Christian form there. Also part of that great uh, group of artists in the 20th century was uh, Epstein, Jacob Epstein. Again, Jewish background. Uh, he was the greatest sculptor of his day in the tradition of Rhoda. Uh, did a number of religious sculptures in the course of his life, including this one, the Head of Christ uh, from 1919 which, as you can imagine, was highly, highly controversial at the time. Many of those artists, were, of course, were influenced by the early art, prehistoric art, which was being rediscovered and looked at afresh again at that time. This is Christ, Behold the Man. Uh, and this is something which is more traditional uh, and more triumphant. It's uh, his Christ in Majesty for 1957 at Clandaff uh, Cathedral. And although the dominant in, in, uh, uh, emphasis in 20th century religious art has actually been upon the suffering of humanity, reflected in the suffering of Christ or focused in the suffering of Christ, occasionally, uh, as it were, a slightly different emphases come through, and particularly in 1957, uh, the end of uh, World War II, new sense of hopefulness uh, and new cathedral being built, for instance, in, in Coventry, and this new work of art in Clandaff, Cathedral Christ in Majesty. Another artist with a unique vision uh, of the whole of life being resurrected into love. Stanley Spencer, deeply religious man, 
with a religious vision all of his own uh, and he painted religious paintings all his life and I'm doing a lecture later on uh, in this series on, uh, on Stanley Spencer's religious vision just taking one 20th century artist to talk about a little bit more depth but I couldn't resist showing three of his, my favourite images of, here, of his here Christ in the Wilderness which you'll find in the Gallery of Western Art in Perth in Australia here is Christ with the foxes here is consider uh, ah, one, I must have, no I'm just uh, and here is my favourite one of all which is uh, the scorpion the extraordinary sense of pity uh, with which Christ is looking at that scorpion in his hand Christ in the wilderness Here uh, is one of my favourite uh, recent artists who painted on Christian themes, Norman Adams, who died in 2005. And in a little church in Manchester, St Mary's, called the Hidden Gem, uh, we have a series of stations of the cross by him, of which this is uh, one, this is station nine or ten, I can't remember which, uh, in which, of course, there is a tremendous sense uh, of the suffering of Christ depicted in that extraordinary, powerful way. Norman Adams uh, considered this series of Stations of the Cross as the greatest work of his life. This is by one of our best-known modern artists, Maggie Hamlin, born in 1945. Uh, every Good Friday she devotes to painting some aspect of the passion scene and this is what she painted on one year ahead of Christ. I'm afraid with all these periods of course I can only give you a, a taster because I'm doing a panoramic uh, view uh, of Jesus in, in art. Of course could easily do a whole lecture on uh, Jesus in, in, in modern art uh, or indeed on most of the other periods as, as well. But I think uh, I've already indicated uh, enough to show uh, that the 20th century, far from being uh, devoid of uh, art on Christian themes, has been, in fact been extraordinarily rich and powerful. If you think uh, of uh, people like uh, Rouault and Epstein, just to mention uh, a couple and uh, Stanley Spencer um, uh, and Norman Adams for example what's also very interesting about our own time is that although there are a good number of actually practicing Christians who are painting and sculpting uh, some of the best known names in the modern art world although they don't regard themselves at least not in public as believing Christians nevertheless don't seem to be able to avoid Christian themes in their work. I mean, uh, Damien Hirst is one. Many of his works of art seem to reflect in some way secular version of Christian themes. Uh, and this is a still from a video of Bill Viola. And you can't look at that, but of course, without immediately bringing in mind a traditional scene of Christ being lowered into his tomb. And finally, before we open up into uh, some general discussion. It's very important to uh, remember always the huge range of cultures in which Jesus has been depicted. He's been depicted in Aboriginal art here, Christ carrying his cross. He's been depicted in Chinese art. This is one of a whole series of paintings of Jesus in Chinese art that dates from the 1920s and 1930s when Christianity was very much on the ascendant in China and indeed it's made a big comeback today. And in India there's also a rich tradition. This is one of my uh, favourites. Uh, this is 
uh, Christ uh, on the lotus, which is a traditional Eastern symbol, of course, for the true self. This is Christ as our true self. Uh, but also uh, set in, in paradise there uh, and uh, drawing on traditional what are called nilotic scenes. Sometimes when the early Christians wanted to depict paradise, uh, they depicted a whole range of different kinds of fish and uh, flora from, uh, from the Nile. So this is a kind of Nilotic scene, but also with uh, Indian animals you can see around. But it's basically the kind of paradise of nature, Christ our true self in paradise restored or Eden restored. So I think that's uh, enough to get a bit of a discussion going. I'm very happy now to take any points people want to make or uh, any questions that people would like to, to ask.